I just would like to see more people willing to do the work and understand that the work is going to be messy. It's going to be hard. It might be a little expensive and you might lose people who don't want to see things change, but it's only going to get enhanced because you're going to, you're going to start getting more diverse gamers coming out there. You're going to start seeing more diverse stories being told more diverse costuming, more diverse lore, setting, set dressing, like the world is only gonna get better if you're more inclusive. Welcome to Replay, the show that invites you to join us at the game table. I'm your host, Clara Mount. On Replay, we're building a more inclusive community by creating a space for underrepresented gamers and their allies to share their voice. We'll tell stories about our experiences and provide new perspectives that challenge our community to think differently about who we are and what we do. Replay is a Victor Media Group original. You can find episodes of this and all other Victor Media Group shows on our website at victormediagroup.co. And if you like what you're hearing, subscribe and connect with us on your favorite social media platform. Today on Replay, we get to talk to Soraya Spinner, pronouns are they, them, who's been LARPing for five years, works as a sensitivity consultant for uh, media and other projects, including games, and is a burgeoning game designer themselves. And for a little extra spice, they're also a burlesque performer and a historian. So uh, basically, I'm a fan, and I'm really excited to get to know them today. Welcome to Replay, Soraya. Thanks. It's so good to be here. So good to be here. I'm so excited definitely to get to talk more about like the sensitivity consulting work that you do uh, in a little bit, but my first segment is always just about games and why we love them because we like to talk about our fucking games. So Soraya, question number one, what is the number one reason that people should care about games? I mean, The Shining said it best, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy and... (laughs) It was, it's actually really weird because I saw this, this Twitter post beam thing that was shared to Reddit and then copied over to Facebook. It's how I get all my Twitter information now. <laughs> yeah. Um, where it was talking about how we kept moving to like, from like work hard, you got to work hard, you got to play hard to like, you got to work hard, sure. And then, you know, maybe we can play a little later. And then it just kept moving the dial from play over towards work. And, and especially in today's society, it's really important that we have time for play yeah. um, to recharge and gaming obviously is a form of play. Mm-hmm. Um, so in order to really survive in this capitalistic hellscape, you need time <laughs> for that. Yeah. For which sure. is really, which is really hard to get for a lot of people, but when you can make time for play, it's so much more rewarding. It makes life mm-hmm. so much better. I totally agree with that. Like I, I mean, my favorite sort of like decompression activity is always like playing games of some kind. And like one of my biggest like social recharge, I'm an extrovert. So one of my biggest social rechargers is like tabletop games because there's people actively like creating a story with you. And it's, um, it's, yeah, I could not imagine life without that opportunity to sort of like recharge and reset. Oh yeah. It's, it's very important. And like, the type of play that you're doing is important and then like who you're playing with like sometimes mm. I'm an introvert so I I get my recharge time from being left alone uh <laughs> but I do also enjoy like playing games with other people especially opportunities to play make-believe with other people because like growing up like my favorite memories were always like when me and my cousins or me and my friends we would all get together and we would play make-believe and stuff so I guess that's probably why I'm a LARPer. That makes so much sense. Like I've heard it said before that uh, all those like imagination games and stuff that we played as kids was just like LARPing without rules. (laughs) Pretty much. Pretty much. I'm like thinking back to my Power Rangers LARP days. Anyway, um, (laughs) fake LARPs. So, um, So you mentioned like a lot of your earliest memories were about like that kind of play. How did you get into gaming? I... So I didn't really get into gaming until like I was like in college um, growing up. Like, yeah, I played, yeah, I played video games. I did not play Dungeons and Dragons until after college. Mm -hmm. I know. I know. Same, actually. (laughs) 
but I was really big into, I was really big into text-based RPing. Yes. Which I, if somebody had told me back then that it was, it was going to be a precursor to like LARP and tabletop, I would have been like, well, hell yeah, I'm a gamer. (laughs) You know, that's a really good point. Like I totally got started on like text-based role play before I had any idea what like D&D was. Exactly. And like, Mm -hmm. what is D&D but like text-based role play spoken out loud with dice? (laughs) That's the best description I've ever heard. (laughs) Oh, someone's going to get mad and they're going to be like, actually, well, actually, and I'll be like, well, actually, I don't care. (laughs) I love it. I love it already. Okay. So, so you came in as a gamer with text-based role play. How did that transition into LARPing for you? So I will admit that I did not know what LARPing was beyond seeing it on like a, a convention schedule and even then it was explained to me like people hitting each other with foam swords and I was like oh okay <laughs> like that doesn't sound fun <laughs> all right cool and then like we had a we had we had a LARPing club in college that I was not a part of until after college <laughs> um but I actually got into LARP through ironically through something that happened with burlesque <gasps> really um, Yes. So I was slated to perform in a festival and it was going to be my first festival. It was going to be my first time like traveling, like really seriously traveling for burlesque. And I was all prepared and I was super nervous, super excited, was having a hard time falling asleep. And I get a message that the airline had canceled my flight. And they (gasps) some reason about weather. I didn't know what kind of weather was going on. I don't know. It was Southwest. So I was really upset, like very, very upset. And my partner at the time was like, I, I, I don't know how to make you feel better, but I know sitting at home probably isn't helping you right now. Would you like to go to this, to this (laughs) heat? They, they didn't want to say LARP just yet because I think they were, they didn't want to scare me away from it. (laughs) But they were like, you know, a bunch of our friends are going to be there and we're going to be playing, we're going to be playing vampires. And I was like, okay, I'm listening. (laughs) Probably tell where this is going. Oh yeah. And I was like, okay, well, I like vampires. I like playing pretend. Uh, You're probably right. Sitting here in my apartment being sad, isn't going to help anything. So that was, that was how they first got me into it. And then they were like, it is on alma mater campus. And I was like, ah, shit. Cause I'd swear I'd never go back there. Aww. So I was like, all right, fine. And then I was like, so what kind of game is it? Like, is it tabletop? Like, are we just like doing improv? And he was like, it's LARPing. And I was like, I don't have a foam sword. How does this work with vampires? And he was just like, you'll see, you'll see. Mysterious. And so we get there and it, it was vampire the masquerade. <laughs> yes classic I had no preparation whatsoever I had no idea what I was going into so like we get there and they had me like my character sheet and like a couple of my friends were already there so like that definitely made it easier and they walked me through it and they were basically like you know it's like Dungeons and Dragons just you're acting out you're acting out what you would normally roll for and I was like oh okay Hmm. Okay. And so I played, I played the game. I was nervous the entire time. I had no idea what to expect. And by the end of it, I was like, so the next game is in two weeks, right? It, it'll be, it'll be in two weeks, right? I want to make sure that I have this on my schedule because I'm coming back. Oh, what was it that uh, made you want to come back so much? It was really just getting to be somebody else for like an evening and getting to do some really cool shit and tell a really cool story with some people that I did not know at the time and have now were like, oh my God, like I would, I would gladly lurk with these people again. Oh, that's so wholesome. I love that. <laughs> it also doesn't help that I met my, I, my current nesting partner there too, as well. That Aww. might've had something to do with it. I like, I like happy stories like that. There's, there was, um, somebody told a story in an early episode on my show about like, uh, 
basically two of her friends meeting each other through like a card game and then you know they ended up getting married and she got to officiate the wedding for them and like blah 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 listen games bring people together <laughs> they really do they really do <laughs> that's how i met my that's how i met bishop oh that's so sweet i love that so what um what are your favorite kinds of games to play now and and why oh let me think um I, it should come as no surprise as a historian. I like playing period pieces. Ooh. Um, I used to be, I used to work in the living history field. Um, so being able to, to do that in a period piece setting is always really fun. Cause it's like, ah, good. I can finally act like how I would want to act if I wasn't, you know, being bound by the man, the man being my supervisor at the time. <laughs> um I also like I found out from a LARP that I actually really do enjoy horror Ooh. horror games like really just dark shit I didn't know that about me and I also like happy funny games too really just whatever I have ADHD too so that like <laughs> kind of makes it hard to like pick a thing oh understandable understandable it sounds like you like games that give you like a chance to sort of like explore different kinds of like, I don't know, high emotions of different kinds. Like to me, like horror is like, I mean, that is terror. That is fear that you're exploring. It's that paranoia or that like suspense. And like, that's a very particular sort of like experience versus like you said, like happy games too. Like that's a very different, like, I don't know. It's like this variety of experiences that you get. Yeah, I guess that really does make sense. Cause I do like high emotion games, like and I build characters that are like based on like high emotions. Like I had just finished a, a game survey for uh, building my character for an upcoming LARP. And it was like, what kind of, what kind of, what kind of characters do you normally play? And I was like, I like playing suffer puppets. I like playing um, anything Did you say that suffer a, puppets. Yes. A suffer puppet. I love I, playing a suffer puppet. I have never heard that term before and I'm in love. I, I got it from my friend Jess. They 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 were the one who introduced it to me, and I was like, "Yes, that's what I like." Amazing. Suffer puppets. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> oh man. So, um, if I could shift gears a little bit, uh, this is my favorite question that I love to ask people. It's just it's just I want to hear a story from you. Tell me about a gaming experience of any kind that was like really personally significant to you, and um, why it mattered. So. This is probably the game experience that really got me into onto the path of of becoming like a sensitivity consultant as well Ooh. as a historian for for games. Is there was this one LARP that ran, I want to say like two ish years ago, um, but it was it was a period piece and it was presented as a way for marginalized people to tell their stories and mm -hmm. it was just the time it was super empowering to know that like I could tell a story that was based on like the history of my people and lore set for my people and build a character who was based on that and it was just really empowering to do that um I did, I did so much research. I did too much research. <laughs> never um, too much. Never too much. Did too much research, <laughs> made too many Pinterest boards, did, it was like, it felt like I was writing a paper, but I was creating a character. And that was really, really nice for me to be able to just take not only my lived experience and the lived experience mm -hmm. of like my ancestors, but also my experience in academia and like doing research and being able to build something that was believable and worked in the setting. Oh, that sounds really cool. It was. So what, um, had, had the game go, how did that lead towards, uh, consulting? Um, it made me realize that I wanted to do, I wanted to do stuff like this more often. And so, after after the game ended um it was just kind of like hmm I want to do this for people professionally how can I do that and it was just really like it was also just like look if you have a setting that's based in a time period that you don't know a lot about or you want to make the setting come alive I will help you do that yeah I love doing stuff like that 
So did it start as just more of like general consulting, um, like more of like that historical sort of context type of stuff? It did. My intention was originally just to do like historical stuff because I noticed that there was kind of a, a gap in in the field with that. I mean, obviously a lot of times game writers who do write period pieces, they typically are already like, they're already interested in the time period or have mm-hmm. like a working knowledge of it. And that makes sense. Like, for example, I'm working on a game that's set in the seventies and I, I fucking love the seventies as a decade, <laughs> but, and to me, I'm like, well, why would you write a game? Why, why would you write a game in a time period you know nothing about? And yeah. Sometimes that happens, or sometimes people are like, I like this as a concept, but I don't know enough about the inner workings of it. I need somebody who does this professionally, especially Mm -hmm. when it comes to doing research, because there's just so much to sift through, and there's a lot of misconceptions that get thrown out there. And like, even just somebody who's like, I can sit, look, I can go through JSTOR for you and pull out the stuff that makes the most sense if that's what you need. Oh yeah. That's such an awesome skill to have too. Um, and I love that you, you know, actively wanted to share that with people. I think that's beautiful. Thanks. So, um, we're going to actually have to cut to a quick break. Uh, so first of all, thank you so much already for sharing your perspective with us and some of these stories. Um, when we come back, we're going to talk more about sensitivity consulting and how to actually make games more welcoming for people of color. Um, and I really hope that, uh, people are able to walk away with some good takeaways from that. So we'll be back in a moment. Stay tuned. Hey friends, have you always wanted to be a corporate sellout? Have I got the opportunity for you? Now you can buy my shirt, wear it to Friday Night Magic or your local Smash tournament and dunk on everyone you know about how your podcasts are better than theirs. If you want to support my show, head over to bubblegumbitchcraft.etsy.com and load up that cart. Again, that's bubblegumbitchcraft.etsy.com so you can cover your shit in replay stickers and whatever else I come up with. (laughs) And hey, thanks for playing. Hey, podcasters and content creators. Question for you. Are you reaching as many people as you want to? You invest time and money to produce the highest quality content you possibly can. But by creating content in only one language, you limit your reach to only the audiences who know that language. I want to introduce you to Victor Voice, a tool that can help you reach a bigger audience by creating audio in multiple languages. Victor Voice is a new subscription software that lets you transcribe, translate, and voice audio in multiple languages. It's easy to use, fast, and accurate. Go to www.victorvoice.co to sign up for your free trial today. No credit card required. That's victorvoice.co. Welcome back to Replay. We are here with Soraya Spinner, who's an avid LARPer and a sensitivity consultant. Um, And we've already heard a little bit about their experiences with LARP and gaming and coming into how they got into sensitivity consulting. But um, I kind of want to kick off this part of the show with just asking, like, based on your experiences as a gamer, why do we need sensitivity consultants? Why do we need this service? I'm so glad you asked that question because if you... (laughs) The reason why we need sensitivity consultants is because a lot of times people only know what they know. Mm. Um, and I know that like a lot of game runners are, are doing their best, but they don't necessarily know when something needs to be adjusted or walked back or expanded upon or maybe just taken out completely um it's the same reason like you hire an editor or a consultant for any other type of thing you want to make sure you're doing right by the work and by your players and by your audience so you make sure that you have people there who have different viewpoints or have different experiences and they can just walk you through it and say hey um maybe maybe we shouldn't do blackface drow for this run of whatever it is we're doing or hey um you describe you describe this player race as backwards and uncivilized and and brutish and all of this shit 
maybe we should think about that and and unpack that Mm -hmm. and take it out or edit it it to make it sound a little not racist you know (laughs) yeah like looking at like the the assumptions you're making right yeah because it's even when people are like oh no I want to make sure I'm being absolutely inclusive I don't want to hurt anybody I don't want to do an accidental racism I don't want to do an accidental ableism I don't want to be accidentally biphobic Mm -hmm. that's why that's why you would hire a sensitivity consultant and it also just also making sure you're hiring the right sensitivity consultant for the job um Mm. just because you know there's some things that I as a black non-binary queer femme cannot speak on and I cannot I mean I could probably say like I don't know it feels like x to me but I am not a member of that group you might want to get a consultant from that group um but a lot of people are just like yeah no we hired a sensitivity consultant we're good yeah like they don't think about more of that like context and like specialty and like they're not it seems like when people just hire whatever sensitivity consultant they don't really understand what they're looking for I guess they really they really don't or there's things that they don't think they need to hire a sensitivity consultant for for example one of the things that I consult on um I consult on sex work um oh And there's a lot of times, I can't tell you how many times that sex work has been in a game and people did not hire anyone to be a consultant on this or even consider hiring a consultant to make sure that their portrayals of sex work were in line and not offensive. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's just like, you guys really needed to hire a consultant, especially needed to hire a consultant for this because you don't, you don't you know, you don't want to punch down, like, you don't want to punch down on marginalized people. And you don't know if you don't know how much of your player base did sex work and might still do sex work and be like, oh, cool. Well, this game thinks I'm a joke. Fun. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking of like, uh, like nineties and 2000s sitcoms where like the gay person was always the butt of the joke or like a, yeah, like not a real character. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Hundred yeah. percent. Yes. Like I can't think of how many like sitcoms where it's like, oh, this person's got a date with a trans woman and they're going to be in for a surprise, and I'm like, that's absolutely terrifying. That's terrible. It, that's just a terrible thing to say in general because, like, yeah. I'm sorry, they're a fucking person. Like, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, that that sort of stereotype, and then that like is pervasive, right? Like, you put that in media, you put those stereotypes about like sex workers or trans people or or black people or whatever it is out there, and people believe that because that's what they're exposed to. That exactly. becomes the association. So yeah, like we we got to prevent that. We got to be a little more aware, right? <laughs> oh yeah. 100 percent and that's really that's really what being a sensitivity consultant is just bringing in awareness like hey you should probably be aware of x y and z like there's there's i know everybody wants to hire a sensitivity consultant and just be told like hey nope you're doing great nothing in here for me to change but a lot of times that doesn't happen Mm mm-hmm and in the rare time that it does happen, it's always weird as the sensitivity consultant because you're like, did I fucking miss something? <laughs> yeah, I like you said earlier, um, like people just don't know what they don't know. And mm-hmm. like, I'm thinking about that and I'm like, yeah, if you hire a sense, like if the default practice becomes to hire a sensitivity consultant, whether you think you need one or not, even if it's just like, I don't know, if you're like, I don't know, I'm a black person writing a game about black people and I still want to hire a sensitivity consultant to double check me. Like, I feel like that is, that should be standard practice. Oh yeah. Like I would always say, always err on the side of hiring the sensitivity consultant. Like, even if it's, even if it's for them to just say like, no, you're fine you're completely fine. Like, at least you can know that you did your due diligence. So if something does pop off, you can, you can at least say like, okay, well, maybe we hired, like, I don't want to say like, well, maybe you did hire the wrong sensitivity consultant. Like Mm -hmm. if you're writing a game about black people for black people, and let's say it's being set in like 
I don't know, the 1930s rural Georgia, mm-hmm. like you would want to make sure you hire somebody who has that experience with like Southern, like Southern history and culture, like mm-hmm. 1930s history, um, as opposed to somebody who is like, well, I have a master's in like urban black history. And it's like, I don't know what they what was going on in 1930s rural Georgia, you know? Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of nuance and sort of like what they would be looking for based on like how specific your game gets. That makes sense. Yeah. And like, not only just hiring sensitivity consultants for like race, but also like gender, sexuality, mm-hmm. like even certain areas of like the country or even certain areas of the world, like not everybody not everybody has the same knowledge and just because you hired a sensitivity consultant doesn't mean like not my job here is done I did it like gold star (laughs) uh I mean does that mean that like games or like game creators should be hiring like multiple consultants with sort of different areas of expertise I would say yes, especially if your game is going to be as big or as pervasive as you think it will be. Mm -hmm. Um, If it's like a big weekend game and it's involving like different backgrounds and races and lores and things like that, you would definitely want to hire at least a sensitivity consultant for whatever background or lore area of expertise they have. Mm -hmm. um if it was about multiple cultures and a world coming together and each culture is based off of a real world thing it might behoove you to have someone who's like hey um this culture this this world is based off uh 1700s europe Mm -hmm. um the the world in the 1700s um we've got people from fake Europe, fake Africa, (laughs) fake South America, fake indigenous cultures. You would want to hire, you would want to hire someone for each culture to be able to tell you like, I don't know, like, you know, your fake, your fake Africans are just a little bit too getting too much of a white man's burden trope Mm. or things like that. Or like your fake Europeans are acting like Europeans from like, the 900s as opposed to the 1700s like you you need to fix that or you use a slur you use this or something because not every sensitivity cold consultant is going to be well versed in everything yeah that makes sense well there's just so much to know (laughs) there really is and a lot of consultants that I've I've seen and met and worked alongside they have their specialties Mm -hmm. um larping in color is a good resource they'll I show love them yeah <laughs> I was about to say like LARPing in color is is doing the thing and especially they have a list of sensitivity consultants that w- do have their expertise listed so if you needed someone for a specific thing like you could literally go to their website and see like oh well so and so they specialize in urban urban POC experiences and I'm writing an urban fantasy LARP so I'm gonna go with them as opposed to the person who only does like period pieces from like 1300 to 1800 like Chinese history or something like that like yeah (laughs) that is the wrong place to go yeah I'm so glad you called out LARPing in color too um they I actually got to interview uh Lawrence good friend Lawrence and Dr. Rachel Cofield, um, they mm-hmm. uh, earlier in the season and they have just fantastic things to say about um, how we can provide resources to make things better for future LARPers and for future gamers in general. So like, I'm so glad you gave them a shout out because that is an incredible resource. I send people to that uh, consultant page all the time. Like, oh, hell yeah. <laughs> all the and time. They all, and they're also doing a thing too, where like, if you need help paying for like, a sensitivity consultant they have like grants and shit that they're working on yes yes that program is live um and that's really cool too plus like 
like uh, webinar trainings and stuff like that. I'm just like, they, they doing good shit over there. So yeah, um, I'm so glad that they came up. I, I want to hype them up as much as possible because I mean, the stuff that you're talking about, like that's so much a part of like why what they're doing is so important. It's why what you're doing is so important. Like um, we, we gotta, we gotta make LARP better for everyone. That's what we gotta do. Exactly. And it's just like, a lot of times and like they even put it on their on their frequently asked questions and that's something that like i've seen like pushback from it's like well if it's offensive like won't our players tell us that it's offensive and it's like yes but it's not going to be the way that you like to hear it yeah when i tell someone that something is offensive i'll i will tell you you know like hey by the way um going through the, the mechanics um this is offensive you need to change it here's some, some suggestions on how you can change it. If me as a player and I see that, I'm not going to be nice about it. Oh, and I'm not no. going to tell you what to do. I'm going to be like, this is fucking offensive. You need to change this. Change it to what? I'm not your sensitivity consultant. I'm not going to tell you how to do that. Like figure your own shit out. It's your game. <laughs> like, yeah. And also like, I would rather if I was making it something, anything, I would rather have someone tell me it's shit before I like put it in the public view. Oh Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> there are some games where like, even though they've like changed things, people still remember them as like, oh, this is the LARP that had X, Y, and Z. Oh yeah. Do you really want, do you really want that to be, oh, this is the LARP that had blank derogatory, you know? Yeah. <laughs> no one wants that kind of legacy. Just, just avoid the whole thing, hire a sensitivity consultant. And, uh, but okay. That being said, sensitivity consultant like hiring a consultant is just like the beginning right like that's the bare minimum that we should start expecting of games oh yeah that is 100 percent the bare minimum and i've noticed a lot i've noticed it's become kind of like trendy to just be like well i've hired a sensitivity consultant or i'm looking for a sensitivity consultant but i look at the picture of your staff and your player base and i'm like ah white <laughs> very white incredibly so what white so what comes next? Um, what comes after hiring your consultant? What else do people need to be aware of? They need to be aware of the fact that both their staff and their player base needs to be diverse and inclusive. Mm -hmm. Like hiring one or two black staff members or staff members of color is, is, is not the move in 2022. Are you telling me that you only know two black people that are good enough to be staff really yeah. just two just two yep it's kind of a fucking sad just fucking sad and like the a sensitivity consultant right is not on staff right like they don't have real power so just hiring a sensitivity consultant doesn't really necessarily create change exactly like i would argue <laughs> sometimes I'm viewed as staff. Sometimes I'm viewed as staff adjacent, but a lot of times I'm just viewed as, you know, exactly what it says, consultant. I am just here to consult. Like I have no power. I can't like, if somebody is having a problem with the game because it's not inclusive or mm -hmm. diverse or even X, Y, and Z, like all I can just say is like, well, I'm, I'm the sensitivity consultant. I can pass it on to the actual staff members, but I can't do anything. Right. Do, is it like, do you frequently experience, um, or I guess how often do you experience that where you've made suggestions and then the staff chooses not to do it? Fortunately, in my experience, knock on wood, um, <laughs> whenever I've made a suggestion, they've taken it and, and followed my suggestion or, or, good. um, changed it. That's but good. a lot of times I even tell them like, as part of my consulting process, I'm like, are you, if I make a suggestion, are you going to listen to it? Like, oh, I know yeah. this is, I know this is your baby. I know, I know that we want our babies to be perfect, but something sometimes it's not going to be perfect and are you willing to accept that mm -hmm. and if you are if I say like hey I know you worked really hard on on this monster but this monster 
has elements of like a sacred religion or Mm -hmm. culture that you really shouldn't be using it for for you know shits and giggles for white people Mm -hmm. like are you willing to change that and most of the time the answer has been yes I will I will change it I did not realize Mm -hmm. that it was this I saw it I thought it was cool I did a little research I thought it was okay and it's like in that case I'm like oh well you you didn't know what you didn't know that's what you hired me for Mm -hmm. but if they're like but I want to do it it's like then you're going to be an asshole (laughs) are you prepared to be the asshole yeah I think I mean so like what I'm hearing the way you talk about this is that when you consult for someone it's because you care about what they're doing right exactly like you aren't um giving them feedback because you want to be mean and watch them fail like they have asked you for feedback and you're kind of giving them the good faith that like their intention is good exactly like whenever I get a new project it's just kind of like all right well I'm gonna make sure that this is I'm gonna do everything in my power to make sure that this is inclusive and equitable and diverse and Mm -hmm. I you're coming to me because you want it you believe in doing those things too so I'm going to I'm gonna pretend I'm gonna not pretend well I'm gonna assume (laughs) that we're working on the same team but if it just seems like you just wanted a sensitivity consultant to check off well I hired a sensitivity consultant then I'm probably I'm probably not gonna be your friend (laughs) yeah yeah, that makes complete sense. So like, okay, so you said what comes next, right? You said talking about like hiring more like staff, people putting people in positions of power, like we said, right? Um, and then the other thing you said was getting more people of color like to just come to your LARP. Oh my God, yes. Can you talk about that? How, what, why? <laughs> I mean, obviously not why, but you know what I mean. Well, for me, one of the very first things, whenever I see a new LARP or even a new, well, a new to me LARP, one of the very first things I do is I go and I look and I see, are there any black people playing this game? Mm -hmm. And if I don't see any black people playing this game, my first question is why? Do you care? First off, do you care that there are no black people playing this game? Oof. If you don't care, then I don't care. And I hope your game fails. Um, <laughs> nope. I mean, <laughs> you telling me, you telling me you don't care. All right, fine. Cool. Don't care about, you know, that there's some really cool black and POC LARPers out there that can only enhance your world, but okay. Um, right. <laughs> but if it's something like, yeah, we're aware and we're not sure how to fix it what have you done Mm -hmm. is this one of those situations where you've tried nothing and we're still all out of ideas or or we've tried and we don't know what to do or we don't even know where to start Mm -hmm. and I feel like a lot of times that can also be what a consultant can help you with is like helping you get people of color and black people to come to your LARPs um what is it what is it about the game that is giving them pause is it the rules is it the accessibility mm-hmm. is it the location is it is it the staff what is it mm-hmm. and you need to figure out like from there like okay what can we do to make this more accessible do we need to do we need to change the location do we need to look at the lore and maybe do a rewrite to make it more accessible to other people do we have things in there like nazis do we have the confederates like what do we mm-hmm. have in here that's causing people to not people of color to not feel like they can come to our game or is it just a matter of fact of like well no we we're pretty inclusive our lore is dope and more i keep i feel like i feel like i'm overusing the word inclusive but <laughs> our lore is inclusive we we've got a very expansive lore we're very accessible what is it is it just like well people just don't know about our game it's like well what are you doing to market to them Mm, yeah like Like specifically to those people of color and like indigenous folks right exactly like are you doing anything to market to people of color are you in are you in facebook groups are you on are you on reddit are you going to cons like Mm -hmm. 
do you do you have a booth set up at a con like there's a con going on right now blurred con that's going on yeah. right now that is just would be perfectly ripe for larps to market because there is there is a desire out there for black people to go to these games it's just they don't know about them mm-hmm. and a lot oh, yeah. of times when i tell like other black people who don't larp but do you know what LARPing is? They're like, oh my God, that sounds so cool. I want to go. Like, where are games that I can go to? And it's like, uh, depends on where you want to go and how far you're willing to travel. But they, yeah. <laughs> are, they do want to come. They do want to come. Mm-hmm. They just need to know about the games. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, and I think like, to your point about um, when you look at pictures of the LARP, right? Like who's playing it? If they are looking at photos um, from a game and they don't see people who look like them, or if people who look like them aren't made to look good in those photos, I've noticed that also. (laughs) Oh my God, yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you just wouldn't, you wouldn't want to show up. Exactly. And it's, you've got to make sure like, this kind of goes back to like making sure like you have, I divert, have a diverse staff. Mm -hmm. um making sure your photographer knows how to shoot and edit people of color yeah and make them look good and not just be like oh well I I can't edit this person's skin so I'm just not going to use this take I'm not going to use this photo and it's like that sounds like you're into me you're not a good you're not a good photographer that's not worth the price that they paid for you but okay Mm -hmm. like yeah a good photographer you're absolutely right should know how to shoot and edit uh skin that is not white Exactly. Yeah. It seems like a basic requirement of the job. (laughs) It really does. (laughs) I was also going to say that it's like, if you're relying on your player base to like connect you to people of color and the fact that like your player base is largely white, like Mm -hmm. you can't just rely on that. Yeah. Like, Maybe they don't, maybe they don't have that kind of relationship with people of color in their life, or they can feel like they can talk about LARPing and trying to bring them to a LARP. Mm -hmm. I I don't know, but you should, you as the game runner, the onus is on you to make sure you're marketing your game Mm -hmm. to everyone that you want to be at that game. And if you're not marketing it to black people or people of color, I'm assuming that you just don't want them to be at your game. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's crazy to me too, that like, People will, I mean, they'll market it, right? Or they'll just do these like broad, like, I'm just going to put out there that we have the thing. And you have to intentionally try to reach those marginalized groups. Like by default, the people that are going to respond to that are going to be the people that are there anyway. If you want to change the people who are showing up to whatever you're doing, like you, you have to change your marketing. Exactly. Sorry, not sorry. (laughs) Yeah, it's basically like you have to be intentional with what you're doing you can't just say you can't just slap diversity sensitivity consulting right we want people of color and hope that it does something you've got to be intentional with everything you do and like game design relies on intentionality Mm -hmm. and you've got to be intentional with with all the decisions that you're making with your game like even from like where the game is going to be held and I get I get it a lot of times the venue comes down to like who's the cheapest venue we can get or like Mm -hmm. what venue do we can't has like bedding and things like that Mm -hmm. but it's also like is this venue in the middle of like trump country is this venue like oh yeah does this venue require you to bring your own mattress? Does this venue require that you bring your own food, but you don't have any place to cook it? Like, that's another thing that goes into accessibility. Like, first of all, like accessibility doesn't just mean for like disabled people, which you should be doing anyway, making sure your venues and games are accessible to all people, but also looking into like, you know, some people don't camp. I, yeah. I am not a camper. <laughs> I do not have camping equipment. Also camping like, equipment is expensive. Like it is, it is incredibly expensive. Holy shit. <laughs> and it's just like, if, if it's a game that requires me to like be out in the woods, like in a tent, I can't go to that game. Mm-hmm. And you know, like 
not every game is going to be for everybody mm-hmm. but there needs to be space for everybody in every game i i, I don't know my fr- my friend is sort of sen- is going to side eye me for saying this but one of my <laughs> friends dan always says something says so- something similar to that mm-hmm And I just think that like, you need to have everybody. I think that you need to have space for everybody in this game to show up. Mm -hmm. Whether or not they show up is going to really depend on like, nope, it's not for me. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. But But if you've taken the consideration, right? Like you've tried to make it possible. Exactly. Like you don't want to just say, well, like, you don't want to use it as a you don't want to use it as a cop out is what you what I'm really trying to say is it shouldn't be a cop out mm. but you should be making an attempt to try and make sure that like okay like yes I get it some people of color will not want to play this game but there are people of color who will want to play this game and we need to try to reach out to them mm-hmm. yeah and I think like <laughs> not to get too deep into this I mean we could uh but like what you said about like you're basically saying accessibility includes like resources so it's exactly it's not just like can you get there um or can you like afford the ticket or whatever it's also like those those other elements of like um comfort level and and all that kind of stuff too but it's just it i think that also is speaking to like a class issue you know like disproportionately people of color tend to be poorer than white people and so like that is a privilege that we have as white people overall i mean that we can have access to the resources to get to those places like more likely to have a car than a black person for instance oh yeah more likely to have camping equipment more likely to have like for the longest time i did not have bedding for like before I started LARPing, like going to like weekend LARPs and things like that, mm-hmm. I didn't have like the necessary bedding. Cause I was like, why do I need 20 Excel sheets? I'm not in college anymore. And now I'm like, well, damn, I have to have, I have to have like my regular bedding sets. And then I have to have one for LARPing. Yeah. I have to have space to put this. I have to have space in my car. Mm-hmm. How am I going to get to this LARP? Right. How am I going to feed myself? It goes beyond like just putting down oh, hey, by the way, like there's some gravel and a rocky path. And it also, it helps everyone. Like it doesn't just help me, it helps everyone. Like, you know, it's kind of like how, it's like the inverse of how like, you know, white supremacy hurts everyone, white people included. Like being accessible and inclusive only helps elevate the game and improves the experience for everyone, white people included. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point to put it like that. And like, I know that, I mean, I know there's like some LARP runners take that really like that access to resources like really seriously and they'll do things like offer programs or like sponsorships or whatever. But like that to me always feels like it's like a band aid, I guess, instead of like really looking at the root of like what about your design is making it difficult to access. Yeah. Like, does it go back to like, does it go back to the very beginning of the design where it's like, we are designing this game for this space, or I've got Mm the specific space in mind. And I want to run this game using the space, like everything else be damned, which is fine. Like, Mm -hmm. that's totally fine. You know, at the end of the day, like having a variety of games only enhances the scene but if everyone is just kind of like well I just want to do this and like everyone else be damned I've got to do this then we have a problem yeah yeah I mean there's consequences for every decision you make yeah and and again going back to the whole sensitivity consultant thing like a sensitivity consultant can tell you like hey I know that you you have your heart set on running this game and like a mansion that was built in 1792 but I just need you to know that like the stairs are too narrow uh this house had slavery um uh everything is rickety and you have to bring your own mattress like this is going to be a problem for a lot of people Mm -hmm. and if someone if 
if you're at the end of the day, you're like, well, I don't want this to be too much of a problem. Like I'm willing to, I'm willing to, we're LARPers. Like we make believe all the time. (laughs) Yeah. Come on. I've never played in an on location, like LARP. All of the LARPs I've ever participated in are like in a room in a building and we make it up. Like, that's fine. (laughs) Like, don't get me wrong. Like, do I love, do I love like a good, like historic house for like as a setting? Yes. But I also oh, yeah. know those things are a pain in the ass. And they They're usually come the with a big cost and then you have to charge higher ticket prices. And like, there's a reason those like blockbuster LARPs are blockbusters, right? <laughs> yeah. But at the, it's also like, I've noticed that like blockbuster LARPs tend to be all inclusive, but it's like, what are you what are you doing to make sure that all inclusive larp is inclusive you know yeah true true there's layers to that there's Um, so many layers (laughs) i i kind of so like i want to ask you like what are some of the challenges that you see like specifically for sensitivity consultants in like the larp um or gaming industry or like whatever you want to speak to on that. But like, what are the challenges that like sensitivity consultants have? Maybe it's because I have anxiety, but (laughs) there's always like, for me, there's always like, whenever I make a suggestion, I'm always like, and they're going to fire me for telling them that this needs to be changed or we're going to have a big blow up or, or whatever, Mm. or they're going to want me to just sit there and like handhold them the entire time. Oh yeah. Or like, they're gonna the whole like do we really need to change it yes you really need to change it but do we really need to change it yes you need to change it if I keep asking you like this over and over again can I wear you down to where you say I don't need to change it and it's like dude why are you so concerned about blackface on these damn drow just why change want, it <laughs> why do you want to make this as a hill to die on yeah oh I see I also have anxiety so I'm sitting here like yep 100% every time I give feedback to someone I always worry that it's gonna create a conflict like 100% it's also just kind of like there's also for me personally the fear that oh my god did I miss something so glaringly offensive Mm -hmm. that they're like it's gonna go out and everyone's gonna be like how could your sensitivity reader miss this and it's like I don't know Oh no. Those are my personal challenges. But like I said, I'm an individual with anxiety. <laughs> um, I mean, do you see like, is there like a community of sensitivity consultants? Like, do y'all like hang out with each other? Like, how does that work? Some, I, you know, if there is, I'm not, I'm not a part of it. I do talk to a couple of other sensitivity consultants mm-hmm. and like, sometimes we're, but we're all just kind of like, can you believe this? Yeah, I can't believe this either. I would love it though. Um, that sounds like something that LARPing in color would probably facilitate. Oh, oh, oh. I hope Lawrence is listening. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna have some suggestions. No, um, because I was just curious because I know like, I, I don't know, like uh, if you're in like the video game industry, there's like entire communities for like trans game devs for their support mm-hmm. for each other, like stuff like that. And I'm sitting here going like, I feel like sensitivity consultants y'all are doing a lot of emotional fucking labor like a lot and like i can only imagine that like you're gonna encounter shit that's very triggering for you um based on your like identity or like your experiences and like i was like i really wish like i don't know i hope you guys have support for that <laughs> to take care of yourselves a lot of time my support is turning to my nesting partner and being like whenever he whenever he like here's like my like hands hit the desk and me turn very slowly they're always like oh god what is it oh no (laughs) oh man I can just like picture that in my head too like (laughs) with like flames of rage like behind you as you turn around (laughs) (laughs) what um I know we're kind of like getting near the end of our time, unfortunately, but I, I guess like my my sort of like last question that I want to ask you is like, what, as a sensitivity consultant in LARP, what is it that you most want to see change? Honestly, I want to see people live 
by their desire to be more inclusive. Like it's one thing to say, like we want a more inclusive and diverse scene. Mm -hmm. It's another thing to actually put your money where your mouth is and do the work. So I just would like to see more people willing to do the work and understand that the work is going to be messy. It's going to be hard. It might be a little expensive and you might lose people who don't want to see things change, but it's only going to get enhanced because you're going to, you're going to start getting more diverse gamers coming out there. You're going to start seeing more diverse stories being told, more diverse costuming, more diverse lore, setting, set dressing. Like the world is only going to get better if you're more inclusive. Yeah. That richness and that variety, right? Not the same perspective all the time. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, that's a great answer. This is, this was so in- informative for me. First of all, I have to say, like, um, I haven't gotten to talk to a lot of sensitivity consultants and especially not about like the work that they're doing, but so it's kind of a little bit of a mystery to me, or it has been a little bit of a mystery to me, even though I like conceptually understand, you know, the purpose. Um, so I hope that a lot of people are really, I mean, I think that a lot of people are really starting to understand that like, sensitivity consulting is a key part of creating good games, um, especially like with an emphasis on diversity and stuff. Uh, Mm -hmm. So I hope that like people, like on my part, I really hope that people are able to listen to what you've said today and really, really understand kind of like why this matters and why why we need to be better about doing this. Um, And also just like where we go from here. So um, I love the suggestions that you gave and all that kind of stuff. So on that note, Soraya, is there uh, any final like message you want to get out there to whoever's listening today? Just know that diversity and inclusion are not, are not buzzwords, even though sometimes they feel like they're, God, sometimes they feel like they're buzzwords. (gasps) Real. That's so real. (laughs) But it's actually something that needs to happen and that it's an action, not, it's an action. It's not just a nice, pretty thing that you say like, oh, we're inclusive, we're diverse. No, you got to show me, show your work. Like, (laughs) tell me what you're doing to make the scene more diverse and inclusive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that show not tell. Yep. And just also know that hiring a sensitivity consultant a lot of times is step one. Yes. Mm -hmm. Amen to that. (laughs) All right. Um, Well, on that note, Soraya, thank you so much for coming on my show. Um, To anyone who's listening out there, I'm going to drop some links for how you can talk to Soraya if you're looking for sensitivity consulting or um, just want to see kind of what they're up to. Uh, I'll have that down in the show notes. But um, yeah, Soraya, thank you so much for coming on Replay today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I was looking forward to this. Thanks for listening. I'll be back again soon with another episode. You can find episodes of Replay and all other Victor Media Group podcasts at victormediagroup.co. Replay is a VMG original and is created, hosted, and produced by Clara Mount. The show's executive produced by J.B. Adams and Gerard Mitchell with sound design by Anna Hughes and original music by Bison. It's the mission of Victor Media Group to make the world a better place by making ourselves better people. If you like this show, follow Victor Media Group on your favorite social channels and check out Bison's other tunes on Spotify, Bandcamp, and SoundCloud. Extra special thanks to all my listeners for hanging out with us today. Keep on playing, and remember, you're always welcome at this game table.